Far away in the distant reaches of our galaxy, there's a small rocky planet orbiting a G-type main sequence star. This planet has three natural satellites and makes a complete circuit around its star once every 430 Earth days. And 300 million years ago, a remarkable sequence of events was set into motion on this remote world. Now known to humans as Wallace 2, it's been found that this unique planet is home to an incredibly diverse range of alien organisms. Fragmentary fossils found in the ancient rocks of this world have allowed us to reconstruct some of the alien beings thought to be early ancestors of the current life on Wallace 2, and what these specimens show us is that from these relatively few conservative basal organisms, a stunning diversity of life has emerged in the last 300 million years, resulting in the extraordinary range of current inhabitants reported to live there now. It's taken our human astrobiologists a long time to piece together an idea of how the Wallace 2 aliens are all related to one another, due to the apparent vastly distinct morphologies they display. But after a significant period of observation, exploration and analysis of the planet's many ecosystems and indigenous life forms, I'm pleased to present to you the latest research into Wallace 2's evolutionary history. Wallace 2 has developed in a way quite unlike our own Earth, and despite evidence of several mass extinction events in the last 300 million years, all of the main clades of organisms originally identified from the fossil record seem to have survived to the present day, and only diversified further and further, filling every possible niche available on the planet. Our astrobiologists have suggested that the punctuated equilibrium theory could explain some of this rapid diversification, proposing that, unlike on Earth where periods of stasis in the evolution of species were more common and bursts of rapid change were relatively rare, on Wallace 2 the rapid speciations took place more often, perhaps due to environmental conditions changing faster or a greater evolutionary plasticity and adaptability of the alien life. Whatever the reasons, there's no denying that the natural world of Wallace 2 is something truly unique. Therefore, here I would like to give you an overview of our researchers' latest discoveries, introducing the various main groups and lineages of organisms that have been discovered living on the planet, and how they're all related to each other. I know many of you have been particularly excited about seeing the results of the Wallace 2 expeditions, so I hope you'll enjoy this video. We'll start off by examining one of the most diverse of all lineages we've studied on this planet, the aliens known as Ambulospeculates. The few fossils we have of the Ambulospeculates from 300 million years ago, a period known as the Tenarian during the Protozoic Era, show that these organisms were quite small, eight-limbed beings with an extensive bony exoskeleton. The exceptionally preserved state of the fossils have even allowed our planetary paleontologists to identify three proboscises, a feature shared by all known early dispeculates from around this time. The Ambulospeculates appear to have been the first of the dispeculates to make the transition onto land, joining the various polyspeculate lineages that had already colonised this new environment. As such, the Ambulospeculates had a great deal of time to quickly diversify and occupy a huge variety of new niches, resulting in the incredible number of groups of modern Ambulospeculates on Wallace 2 today. Thanks to the tireless efforts of our brave and dedicated astrobiologists, particularly Yellow Panda 2001, we can now present to you the results of a long period of genetic and morphological studying, revealing the latest in Wallachian evolutionary biology with this comprehensive overview of the complex relationships between all the ambulospeculates currently known to science. As you can see, two main groupings have been recognised by our researchers within ambulospeculates, and we'll begin our examination of this group by looking at one of the more basal clades within this main division. Alcyon Uvermia contains quite a few members, the most basal of which is the coral worm, Camovermis cyvus, a curious organism that has left the terrestrial habitats of its ancestry to inhabit the Wallachian coral groves in the shallow seas surrounding the southern archipelago of Media Insula. The coral worm possesses a characteristic mane of hairy filaments which are used to locate prey, this integumentary feature also being found in many of the other vastly different related members of Alcyon Uvermia. Some more derived members of this clade include the crowned ice beast, Diadematus glacis bestia, and the Derpison. The Diperson seems to have independently lost any hairy integument, however the cold-adapted ice beast has a thick layer of hairs to aid in retaining heat. Something else worth noting, indeed it's something of a common trend in many different groups of Wallachian aliens, is the internalisation of the ancestral bony exoskeleton. Although some external bones do remain in many taxa, there's a great deal of convergence between species in which the endoskeleton has become bony instead of being made of cartilage. The hairy filaments are another prominent feature of the related Insulaculian and Crinitusavum taxa. In the mostly arboreal Insulaculians, this hair is remarkably dense and present in every of the relatively diverse species. In the Crinitusavum genus, it's less dense but still a notable feature, even seemingly being exapted as a display structure in males, which tend to have a greater extent of this integument type than the females. 
The next grouping are the basodids, which also possess hairy integuments used for insulation and protection from parasites. This family of organisms is arboreal too, in addition to displaying behaviours suggesting they're relatively intelligent and highly social, and they have developed prehensile proboscises to help them climb through the bone trees of the planet. Next we come to Celestiplura, another very diverse clade in the Ambulospeculids. The more basal subgrouping within Celestiplura includes organisms such as Troglodytus segmentia, Uncataplura imperata, and Rematergi, all taxa that have retained a lot of their bony exoskeleton and become highly segmented, extending the number of their limbs in the case of the closely related Rematergi and Uncataplura. The giant Rematergi of Tenebris are a particularly impressive sight to behold, growing up to 20 metres long in some species. Studies of their genetics and ontogeny have revealed that from the age of about three Wallace years onwards, these aliens start adding new body segments with limbs, allowing older individuals to grow to the massive sizes they get to. More derived members of Celestiplura are quite different in overall morphology to these organisms, however. For example, there's the Hoplotarx genus, which has fused the two back pairs of limbs and shows a remarkable degree of convergence with certain prehistoric species found on Earth, as well as the closely related Oriduorum and Sembora sederia genera, which have also lost the fourth limb pair. The dune hopper, Sabulia mobilis, actually still retains some evidence of this limb reduction. Unlike the hoplotarx, the limbs in Sabulia have become vestigial small protrusions, apparently independently of the limb reduction in Oridurorum and Semborosideria too. This is another trend observed in many Wallace II taxa, the reduction or loss of certain limbs over time from the basal condition of eight. After Celestiplura is Silvoidia, a group that includes the closely related genera Xenotitan and Terrabrodente. This is another example of limb number reduction, however in this case the anterior and posterior limb pairs have both fused, resulting in just four limbs in total. The fusing in Xenotitan is not as complete as in Terrabrodente, but they are still well suited for the lifestyles they lead, grazing about in shallow waters. It's clear that this limb fusing occurred independently of that in derived Celestiplurs, since the most basal member of Sylvoidia, the highly specialised Silva spicatas, actually has a partial fusing of the anterior pairs of limbs instead, while its posterior limbs have adapted to facilitate a saltatory mode of locomotion. Moving on to another grouping, we come to Edurus conchoidea. The members of this clade all retain the ancestral condition of eight limbs, though in some taxa, such as the symbiotic Edurus conchia genus, the limb pairs have been modified and now function as sorts of mandibles. Something that unites many of the Edurus conchoids is the retention of a great deal of the bony exoskeleton, with many species having extended this for defensive purposes. Flagellum cortis, Armai udu, and the paddle cattle, for example, all have protective bony shells. Quite a few Edurus conchoids have also secondarily returned to the water, or at least inhabit coastal regions, such as the Sandhopper, Maca, and the previously mentioned Taxa. Next, we have Altufonsia, a grouping in which all members retain, to some extent at least, the full eight limbs of the earliest Ambulospeculids, as well as relatively extensive bony exoskeletons. Altufonsians are still remarkably diverse though, from the savannah living digging adapted Mantimimus savannae, to Sangui Venandi, a leaping, extravagantly crested creature that spends its time searching for prey in shallow lagoons and tide pools, and the closely related tide springers, which also move by saltation, inhabit coastal regions, and use display structures on their heads known as flag flaps. The Gunnerluck, Teratolabra magnus, is another member of this clade, and lives on the beaches and in the marshes of Media Insula, both hunting and scavenging whatever they can find. Their rear limbs have become adapted for various functions it seems, including as sensory apparatuses for detecting surrounding objects, for digging into substrate, in addition to cleaning themselves and even for the process of mating. Remarkably, they're not just used in sexual display, but the bristles on them actually have microstructures that absorb the male sex cells, allowing for easier transference to the females. The long tails on these aliens are pretty deadly weapons as well, being used as effective self-defense structures. One of the most derived lineages of Ambulospeculids found today on Wallace II are the members of Xenopeda, a clade which has gone a quite different route than the others we've looked at so far. Many Xenopedans have become very small in size over time, converging in many ways with certain insect species from Earth. The Xenopedans also show a remarkable diversity and include species such as Draco Aranea malivora, a colonial organism that constructs large nests where they farm species of Celestophyte for their sweet excretions, as well as the closely related Xenotetraptorex genus, an inhabitant of Meridianum forests that uses one of its proboscises in a similar way as an earth chameleon's tongue to catch prey. Flight is an ancestral feature of all Xenopedans, and all members of the clade still retain the ability to fly to some extent. 
The Xenopedon known as the tree sap mosquito is another interesting organism, using the elongated bone on the head to puncture celestophytes and extract nutritious fluids with its proboscises. Closely related to this taxon is the tweezer fly, which also feeds on fluids within celestophytes, holding the flower-like structures found in some celestophytes in place with its specialised proboscises while feeding through a central opening. Moving on to one of the first diverging lineages from one of the other main ambulospeculate groups, we come to Aerotheria. As this is one of the more basal groups of another major radiation, it would appear that flight was actually a basal characteristic, as indicated by the number of flight-capable species in Aerotheria, but has been secondarily lost on multiple occasions in later subgroups. The more basal Aerotherians, including Ervenator, the Aerial Ganger and Teroaga Pitecne, all use thin membranes of skin stretched between their limbs to fly, However, in derived aerotherians, this skin membrane has been replaced by hairy filaments, similar in some ways to the hairs of the Alcyon euvermians, and possibly homologous. Evidence of the evolution of this novel method of flight is represented in the unusual species Trivolans pulhellus, which seems to have diverged during a period when these organisms were first developing hairy filaments on their skin membranes. The most derived aerotherians, including Haemodactylus carpocinus and Nimbus leo, are both very small organisms that, remarkably, possess large hairy filaments on their limbs that show an incredible convergence with the flight feathers of Earth birds, aiding in their flight and also acting as display structures in Haemodactylus. The other filaments covering the rest of the body also offer protection from harsh environmental conditions. After the Aerotherians had diverged, the clade known as Caidifuremia appeared. Today, this is another highly diverse grouping filled with all sorts of unique morphologies. There are two main subgroups within the Caidifuremians, with one clade retaining the ancestral condition of flight, while the other has adapted for a more terrestrial mode of life. These flying members include the remarkable paper hawks, Ardokinesia velocitas. The body of A. velocitas resembles traits found in birds and insects of Earth, consisting of a similar body shape to birds of prey, while exhibiting features of insectoids such as segmentation of the limbs and a spherical respiratory system. The exterior bony plates found in ambulus speculids have developed into a form of protective exoskeleton as a method to cope with the forces placed on the body when diving at high speeds and the shock caused to the body upon impact with prey items, with these plates acting as a buffer for the internal organs. Related to Ardokinesia is Mobia dipoli, an organism that originated on the island surrounding Veda Mary before spreading further to other landmasses around this sea. Mobia adults hunt by skimming the claws on their limbs through the water, catching any unfortunate dispeculates that happen to be near the surface. Other flight-capable Caedifuremians include Sporovenator honi, which uses two feathery proboscises to trap spores in the air and feed on them, as well as the closely related Osphurs pertilio. Both these taxa use two main wings, tipped with claws and with skin membranes between them, to fly. There's a truly great diversity of these flying Caedifuremians, for example the species Luminocolaris lancii, Malifyrax and Toxicus, which all possess incredible and unique specialisations for their particular lifestyles. Among the non-flying secondarily terrestrial Caedifuremians, there's the Arboreal Arboretiniae family, the island endemic Aranea forms, which include arboreal, terrestrial and aquatic species, and Fabacursoridae, a diverse family of obligate bipeds that have adapted to many different environments. The most derived of this subgroup are the taxa Caedicenos and Nupius, both six-limbed, mostly herd-living organisms. Next, we come to a clade called Adriae anatia, the members of which can be identified mainly by the shed feature of the reduction of their middle two limb pairs, in addition to a retention of much of the external bony armour. The literal Sagard is one of the more basal members of this group, with this species using the long filaments on its neck to cultivate microorganisms which attract small dispeculates that are then in turn fed on by the Sagard. Closely related is the tree drinker, a more terrestrial organism that feeds by piercing the trunks of bone trees. The pitcher duck is a fascinating member of this group, having a very specialised lifestyle. Its middle two limb pairs have been exapted for use in holding and camouflaging celestophytes, while its central proboscis mimics a celestophyte and even secretes an attractive smelling liquid. When smaller organisms, such as the previously mentioned tweezer flies, come to try to feed on it, the tail of the pitcher duck is then used to kill them, allowing the alien to eat the organisms. The closely related Titanothalassus and Clavitherium are more examples from this clade, with Titanothalassus adapting to a more aquatic lifestyle, while Clavitherium remains terrestrial. There's also a radiation of larger predatory Adriaenatians, which today includes the taxa Loricatorum salamandra and Christoceragnath ruptus. Loricatorum is a semi-aquatic ambush predator that behaves in a very similar way to the modern crocodilians of Earth, while the giant Christoceragnath is more terrestrial, running down its prey across forested floodplains. 
Polyraptoria is next, another clade which has retained much of the exoskeleton in most species. The related Osteoraptoridia family and Polystomatotherium are some examples of this ambulospeclid group, both of which are eight-limbed, heavily armoured organisms. However, while Polystomatotherium uses its proboscises and extra appendages, which are likely homologous with the proboscises, to dig around in soil for prey, or steals the kills of other smaller aliens, Members of Osteoraptoridia, typified by Osteoraptor gigantis, have adapted their front limb pairs into effective scraping structures used to break bits of bone from bone trees. Other polyraptorians include the very closely related Distratopodi rapalius and Unoculum noctocursa. Both these organisms have fused the posteriormost limb pair into a cartilaginous tail to help with balance. Both species also have a large joined single compound eye, and it's these features that hint at an ancient relationship between the two taxa. However, in the time since their divergence, these creatures have adapted to very different lifestyles, with Distratopodi feeding from the high tops of bone trees and other celestophytes in large herds, while the much smaller Unoculum are semi-nocturnal generalists that inhabit the dense forests of Occidentus. Terrarus is another interesting polyraptorian, being more derived than the others we've looked at. This taxon is a predator that's adapted for life in mountainous and volcanic regions, burrowing into the ground to disguise itself as rocks. Terraros only retains three limb pairs and has a particularly unique walking style, in addition to being a powerful leaper. This brings us next to Oscanida, a small taxonomic group that only includes the family Wallachicanidae, containing the red-bellied bone dog, and Dorionyx venatus. Both taxa retain bony exoskeletal armour, and both taxa have reduced the posteriormost limb pair. In the bone dog, these limbs are just vestigial lumps, however in Dorionyx they're utilised in the mating process. Interestingly, Dorionyx possesses a mane of filaments which seem to be homologous, not convergent, to the hair seen in more basal groups, suggesting that this feature is still able to reappear in derived ambulospeculates, perhaps an example of an atavism, or evolutionary throwback to an ancestral condition. Soli Orgaria is another fairly small clade which includes the family Proboscis acutidae, bone tree feeding terrestrial aliens with a unique hypertrophied central proboscis as well as Kella augurae, a small jungle living taxon with extendable proboscises, and the Sun Eater, a deep sea living ambulospeculid that inhabits waters near hydrothermal vents and lives in a symbiotic relationship with organisms known as bone flies. The sister taxon to Soliorgaria is another large grouping full of diverse organisms, Oromalabia. One of the more basal species within this group is Thorax lanius, the jumping rock. Jumping rocks are a plentiful scavenger species that have evolved to basically be filter feeders on land. Its largest proboscis has thick hairs at the end that it uses to filter through sand in order to find food. Its other two proboscises are used in order to feed on larger, still living prey, and are filled with sharp teeth made for cutting up large pieces of organic matter. However, further into the proboscis, the teeth become less sharp and more round, as to grind down food before it enters the stomach. Closely positioned to the thorax genus is the Oromalabian family Loricato-Titania, which includes a creature known as the Plain Mower. Like thorax, it's fairly heavily armoured and has four limb pairs. However, the rear pair is only present in the females, and is used to carefully manipulate the eggs during the laying process. These are a herd of living species that feed on small celestophytes, and have incredibly deadly tails which are used in defence. Another interesting Oromalabian is the Mountain Chipraca, one of the last remnants of a much more diverse subgroup within this clade. These ambulospeclids behave in a similar way to the dung beetles of Earth, moving the waste of other organisms around. They put these waste pills in their dens and use them to attract mates, feed on, and even lay their eggs in. Mud lurkers also display unique behaviour, burying themselves in the marshes and swamps of Wallace II, watching out for other nearby creatures with its protruding eye stalks, and using a venomous barbed tail to catch unsuspecting prey. In a slightly more derived position than the mud lurker is the Doryglossa family, which includes a species known as the mantis wolf, Doryglossa novispavo. This is a fearsome ambush predator native to many islands around Media Insula, using a deadly spear-like proboscis to impale other organisms. The Sauromimus genus is another formidable predator that inhabits the swamps and mountain range of Media Insula. This taxon is a perfect example of another evolutionary convergence observed in many Wallachian aliens, the appearance of jaws, or pseudo-jaws. In this genus in particular, the structures seem to have developed from the ancestral proboscises. However, in other cases they have been proposed to have originated from bony processes of the exoskeleton, or even from the anteriormost limb pair. An example of one of these other types of jaw can be seen in Gitanonychus. This is more of a pseudo-jaw formed from the bony exoskeleton. 
the primary function of the structure being to protect the proboscises from damage, and also as a display feature. The sister taxon to this organism is a beast known as the Great Forest Devourer, which possesses homologous jaws that perform the function of crushing through the tough trunks of bone trees. These massive ambulus speculids are remarkable for their capability of devouring the entirety of the trees, from the softer photosynthetic organs of the canopies to the entire trunk and root system. Moving now to the other, much smaller main radiation of ambulus speculids, we come first to Maya dorsa. The most basal member of this clade is an organism commonly known as the lumber cow, Xenobovine keratocranos. This species has reduced its bony exoskeleton over most of its body, something seen in many more derived members of Maya dorsa, only retaining exoskeleton plates over the head, and possessing an internal skeleton composed mostly of bone. These beasts will often push over large bone trees on the edges of forests by rearing onto their back four legs, before then consuming the photosynthetic organs that grow at the tops of the trees. An interesting branch of Maya dorsa includes the taxa Macrolimus stomachiri and Loricarum eversa simia. Though fairly closely related, these ambulospeculids have adapted to very different lifestyles. While Macrolimus has converged with the previously mentioned Distropodi, also feeding from the high tops of bone trees, the much smaller Loricarum eversa, an island native, has adapted to climbing and breaking off the armour of the tough night trees of its habitat. The rear two limb pairs have also convergently fused, allowing for more powerful leaping into and between the trees. Another arboreal adapted Myodorsan is Cristunguis bestia. These creatures show an example of the foremost limb pair developing into functional jaws, and they've reduced their bony exoskeleton into quill-like spines which are used for crypsis. The bullet shrew is another pretty terrifying member of Maya dorsa, a small ambush predator of large open plains that, through the use of their limbs tensing and firing, propel themselves at incredible speeds into unwitting prey, lodging themselves in their bodies and feeding on their insides. Aranicolus nanos, commonly known as the sand truri, is a small nocturnal desert burrower within Maya dorsa. Most of their bodies are covered in tawny and white keratin fibres. Most of the bony exoskeleton has been lost in favour of this fibrous body covering to keep cool in the scorching day and to stay warm in the freezing nights. Their frontmost pair of legs still retain some of their bony covering, which is formed into a clawed appendage used for digging out their elaborate burrows, and their hind pairs of legs have become dual-purpose appendages. They're used as display structures to impress potential mates and are also used to keep the creature cool. Another desert-dwelling relative of Aranicolus is Calda apidem bovis, the desert cow. These organisms went a different way to burrowing, using stores of body fat to sustain them as they move through the deserts of Wallace II in herds, looking for oases where they can search through the sand with their specialised snout bones to find small organisms to feed on. One of the most diverse of all ambulospeculid families is Maya peltidae, a clade of Maya dorsans that are notable for some of their very mammal-like features. This family has also evolved jaws from the ancestral bony exoskeleton, and notably have modified the second limb pair into a pouch, present in both males and females, for transporting eggs and young. These organisms are also venomous, with the two side proboscises, which are now vestigial mouths, possessing small fangs that can inject venom. Four different genera of myopelted survive to modern times, from the more heavily armoured polyaspis, to the highly social platyaspis, the giant grazing ground sloth-like gigantodendranops, and the tiny burrowing rhinochirus. Finally, we come to the last of the ambulospeculid clades, Ceta thalassa. One of the ancestral features that unites the members of this group is the fact that they all evolved from some of the earliest ambulospeculids that returned to life in the water. We've seen other ambulospeculids return to the water independently in other lineages, but the Ceta thalassans all shared a common aquatic ancestor at one point in Wallace II's history. However, just because they were all aquatic in the past, this hasn't stopped some Cetothalassans returning to the land anyway. Epistrepsi potithalassa is a fascinating member of the group as it is now secondarily terrestrial. During this lineage's time as aquatic organisms, the front limb pair became large paddle-like structures and the other six limbs fused into a sort of bone fan that acted like a rudder. However, when changes in sea levels and climatic events in Wallace II prehistory opened up more terrestrial niches for these organisms, they adapted to these new environments, now moving snake-like over forest floors and swamps and using its forelimbs to dig up and scrape food from celestophytes. The family Cetesta and the species Maritanium rex are quite closely related Cetothalassans, with both taxa retaining a significant amount of bony exoskeleton, in most species anyway. The Cetesta family includes two surviving genera and three species in total, and one of these genera, Spiriventris, possesses a unique, oil-filled orb-like organ on the head which are used in intraspecific communication. The other genus, Perditesta, 
has reduced its exoskeleton in favour of faster swimming speeds. Triacrenasus duchii is another fascinating member of this group that has an interesting symbiotic relationship with a species of Celestophyte, and also in the group is the genus Ventuscebum, fairly large torpedo-shaped swimmers found all over Wallace 2's oceans. Due to their fairly common nature, a good deal is known about much of their internal anatomy. Finally, the Spinobrachii velocivenatus, another organism with jaw-like structures formed by the first limb pair. These jaws can be shot out at incredible speeds thanks to springy muscles at their bases, allowing the bony knobs on them to crush through the armour plating and endoskeletons of their prey. Well, that brings us to the end of the Ambulospeculids. As you can see, this is an incredibly diverse group that has undergone all sorts of astonishing radiations as they filled the niches available on the planet. Next, we're going to take a look at the Kelonantids, a grouping descended from ancestors which were once fast-moving aquatic organisms with a reduced bony exoskeleton. One of the first lineages to branch off within Kelonantida was Phytovora, a group that includes the taxa Phytovorus mimus and Hastami petramum. This group has redeveloped some pretty extensive bony armouring, with both members being predatory. While Hastami is an ambush hunter, Phytovorus mimics certain other species of organisms that only feed on Celestophytes, however is actually a lethal predator of dispeculates. Within the other branch of the Kelonantids, there is then a radiation of organisms which mostly stayed in the water, apart from a few derived taxa, and a radiation which evolved from a common ancestor that made the transition to land. The fact that the Kelonantids also made this transition, separately though millions of years later than the Ambulospeculids, is a true testament to the remarkable adaptability of Wallachian life, as well as the diversity of available niches that have existed here throughout its history. Dentamontia represents a lineage that branched off during this transitional period within the Kelonantids, as there are semi-aquatic and fully terrestrial members. For example, the Sensum genus is able to walk along the bottom of shallow shores but still needs the support of water. Additionally, Dentacranial ichthyoid mostly lies in a docile state in bodies of water but can leap out and glide with its fins for short distances. And the Zoomontes genus includes five different species, some of which are fully aquatic and some which are fully terrestrial. Further along the more derived branches of this lineage is Oculia, which only contains a single surviving taxon, Oculus magnus kelanantis. Despite now being aquatic again, this species evolved from terrestrial ancestors. However, they were driven back into the water when the western lands bridge they once inhabited became mostly submerged. Oculus is also another case of the front limb pair evolving into pseudo-jaw-like structures, and it possesses a defensive shell with striking, eye-mimicking markings to try and confuse predators. Next, we come to Oceodontida another grouping of fully terrestrial derived Kelanantids. All members of the clade retain the ancestral eight limbs, though in the Leophyphon genus the middle two pairs have reduced and now aid in prey restraint. The extent of the bony exoskeletal armour is variable within Oceodontida. The Oceodonta family within this larger group have also independently developed jaws derived from the proboscises of their ancestors. Another grouping of highly derived terrestrial Kelanantids is the clade known as Venennu maxima, the Drapanopod genus is an example of a member of this lineage, a small predator of tropical regions that uses two of its proboscises to inject a venom into its prey and the central organ to feed. Pedisculptro is another Venenu maximum, an organism adapted to life in mountainous regions that, like others we've looked at before, have the middle two limb pairs now functioning differently to the other weight-bearing main limbs. In the Pedisculptro, however, these limbs are now sharp, knife-like limbs which are used in defence. The Valero Viditia lineage is an intriguing subgroup within this clade, with the only surviving member of the group being the genus Calero Calidia. There were other genera within this lineage, as indicated by some fossil remains, however they seem to have been victims of the immense radiations of life that occurred on the planet. With so many niches being filled, and such extreme competition, some organisms were bound to go extinct, and so it seems to be the case with the Valero Viditians. The locomotory method of Calerocalidia is interesting, with four large spikes protruding from two limbs being used, which makes these creatures fast but quite unstable. They are also able to shoot out a bone-tipped proboscis using air sacs behind them, which the living genus uses to pierce the hard exteriors of bone trees. The Keleralis genus is the sole member of Keleralia, descended from a lineage that convergently evolved flight. The frequent independent origin of flight amongst dispeculates may have something to do with Wallace 2's relatively lower surface gravity, making attaining flight slightly easier than on Earth, coupled with the previously mentioned high adaptability of life on this planet. The mountain runner, Palyracos dromius, and closely related Dilaterion dente taxa are some excellent examples of fully terrestrially adapted Kelanantids in the Vexilia melia clade. The common ancestor of these aliens appears to have possessed some filamentous integument, which in the mountain runner has become a thick, insulating pelt. 
while in deleterion it's become more of a display structure. Moving over to the other main radiation of Kelanantids, we come to Kruki Pascensia. This other large radiation is ancestrally aquatic, like the first Kelanantids were, although some more derived taxa have on occasion independently become secondarily terrestrial or even flight capable. One example of such a transition can be seen with a crosswing, a Kruki Pascensian that hunts in the sky during daytime but returns to the water to rest at night. These huge beasts retract their proboscises while they fly to reduce drag, only exposing them to catch organisms in the air. Another member of the same group is the species Chalcorinatus symbiosis, a small, shallow sea-dwelling, flat-bodied organism that lives in a symbiotic relationship with microscopic polyspeculate colonies which inhabit its bony armour plates. In return for protection, these polyspeculates provide the Kelanantid with most of its nutritional needs. Then there's also Cetisimex, a large marine species that lives in pods of up to 30 individuals and filter feed, prey and scavenge on smaller marine life. Next we come to Alcyonu caputia, a grouping which includes two taxa, Alcyonium comedenti and Ross caput. Both these organisms are small Kelanantids which feed on marine polyspeculates, and both inhabit the shallows around a very unique island on Wallace II known as Isla Inferno. This is an area we'll be coming back to, but it's one of the most intriguing and dangerous places known on the planet, formed by two volcanoes and filled with unique but deadly life. The organisms here are so diverse and are still under study by our researchers. There are so many unique aliens present in this region that only a few have been properly integrated into the latest phylogenetic studies, and many have only roughly been assigned to the different main lineages. It's an exciting area to study and all sorts of new discoveries are being revealed all the time by the brave scientists and explorers who dare to uncover the secrets of Isla Inferno. After that clade, we reach Concavotheria. Again, only two related taxa are currently placed within the subgroup, Concavoculus and the genus Delgatitotherium. Both are also aquatic, and the Concavoculus grouping contains three known genera. These organisms have developed a single large patch of compound eyes that have folded inwards, and two of the proboscises are now also functioning as pseudo-jaws. Delgatitotherium is a large marine predator found in many seas of the planet, using its three specialised proboscises to process prey items, and also as display structures. Next is Megadontia. This is also a clade of derived aquatic organisms with a great deal of diverse members. The Spinodon genus, for example, is a small fast-moving predator that dispatches prey with its sharp fang-like teeth, while the species Megapteregia epiphanus is a large filter-feeding organism that has a symbiotic relationship with a polyspeculate. These polyspeculates parasitize the dorsal armour plates of the Kelanantids, however both organisms benefit from the presence of one another, exchanging substances like we've seen before in Corsa renatus. Also in Megadontia are the Nepirs, two taxa of which are currently known. The Nepir is a large creature that feeds on marine polyspeculates and occasionally the eggs of other organisms, while the green-tailed Nepir, being smaller than their relatives, feed on smaller dispeculates as well as eggs. The group Scaphonomadia only includes a single living taxon, Scaphonomades, also known as the boat nomad. This is an interesting organism that has evolved a eusocial lifestyle, similar to that of Earth termites, constructing large and complex floating nests that move between the planet's reefs. There are six different forms of boat nomad, each one performing a particular task to keep the group alive and maintain the nests. The clade Pisciliboria is an interesting grouping, composed of two related taxa that, like the crosswing we met earlier, are aquatic but also have the ability to glide through the air for significant distances. The blue glider utilises all eight of its wing-like limbs in order to maintain lift, whereas Piscem ducatus has reduced the front three limb pairs in size and now mainly uses its rearmost limb pair to provide lift. Both taxa retain all three proboscises, however in the blue glider two of them have become specialised harpoon-like organs used to spear prey, while Piscem mainly feeds on small planktonic polyspeculates. Next we come to Consuvo cucumia, another group of diverse aquatic organisms, including the Phalanges dontidae family, commonly known as Talonjaws, an amphibious carnivorous species of dispeculata that have a huge, almost unhinged jaw. They primarily feed on small dispeculates. Their most common strategy is to submerge or hide in debris or dense polyspeculates. Their forward-facing compound eyes detect when suitable prey comes within range. Once prey comes close enough, it catches it with its two very finger-like adapted proboscises. Then there's also the bristled beakfish, a large predator of the rivers and lakes of the planet that detects prey through sensing vibrations more than sight, and the closely related giant sawbill, which relies much more on sight, and like its relative has eight eyes in total, though in the beakfish they're highly reduced. 
The giant sawbill is also a large predator of other marine organisms, using its serrated tooth-like structures on the rostrum to injure and incapacitate prey before using its proboscises to feed. The vapor shark is another interesting member of this group, with adults laying their eggs inside marine polyspeculates, enabling the embryos to steal the nutrients from the organisms, and once they hatch the young then try to attach themselves to large carnivores, using their mandibles to latch on and parasitize them. Eventually they become too large for this and begin filter feeding independently, their proboscises enlarging to enable such a shift in feeding strategy. Next, we're moving to another large grouping of Kelanantids which, incredibly, have independently evolved terrestrial capabilities from an aquatic ancestor shared with the groups we've just examined. The first group to diverge from this other lineage is Terracolia, which includes taxa such as Teramis, an inhabitant of the lush forests and jungles of polyspeculates in the northern hemisphere, and has modified some of its limbs into feathery structures that are now used in display. Also in this group are the related Durgol and Mudstalker, both only possess six limbs in total and have retained some external armour to an extent, but like most Kelanantids also have a bony internal skeleton. The Durgol only uses two limbs to locomote, inhabiting arid regions and quickly extending its single proboscis to consume polyspeculates. The Mudstalker is an incredibly tall organism, also with only one proboscis, that ambushes prey in swamps and has an intriguing dorsal fin used for display. Septivola is an interesting Kelanantid clade, as this group has convergently evolved flight capabilities, independently of the other flying Kelanantids we've encountered so far. Septivolans tend to utilise their first two limb pairs as the main flight surfaces, however this does vary somewhat within the group. Vermis sanguis volans, also known as bloodworms, use their fused front two limb pairs to support a membranous wing structure, using their flight abilities to hunt for large terrestrial creatures at night, echolocating to find their way before latching onto their flesh and consuming their circulatory fluids. Septimales volucris is another example of a septivolan, however this species utilises all eight of its limbs to spread its membranous wings between, likely representing what the ancestral condition of flight was like in early septivolans. Septimales is migratory, travelling from the mountains of northern Media Insula south towards the equator, using its proboscises with feather-like filaments at the end to trap small organisms. Finally, we come to Manicosauria. This group is another terrestrial radiation that shares a common ancestor with Terracolia and Septivola, however one member of the clade, Lutrincidus, commonly known as ambush otters, have actually mostly returned to watery habitats once again, with the different species being either semi-aquatic or fully aquatic. Other terrestrial Manicosaurians include the closely related Sustansaurisup genus of the Polyvoridae family and Manicobrachium magna of the family Manicidae. Well, that brings us to the end of the Kelanantids, another remarkably diverse grouping containing all sorts of fascinating morphologies and novel evolutionary developments, as well as the rampant convergent evolution that seems to be so common in Wallace II life, showing how incredibly adaptable these organisms are. And that also brings us to the end of this first part. I did want to try and fit every group into one video, however this instalment has already gone on for a very long time and we're nowhere near covering all the different groups of Wallachian aliens, so there will probably be another one or two parts to this series at least. I'd also like to apologise for not being able to include every single Ambulospeculid and Kelanantid entry in this video. Of course I'd love to, but there's just really no way to get through the groups when there are so many fantastic entries so unfortunately I had to cut quite a few from being mentioned. But as long as the name of your organism is in one of the cladograms, it is officially canon. I also apologise for not being able to spend as much time talking about each individual entry as I would have liked, but again, in trying to include as many as possible, I unfortunately can't spend too much time on one particular alien. Still to come are the descendants of the heavily armoured filter-feeding Panoplovitans, the large predatory Gomphiobians, the strange mobile sun grazers, and the many different terrestrial as well as aquatic photosynthetic polyspeculates. I hope you're excited for the next video, and thank you again to everyone for sending in your amazing alien designs. I really hope you enjoyed this video, thank you for watching, and a big thank you to our Patreon supporters, especially our Dinosaur Tier supporters Nicole Bueno, Dominic Bathy, and Puschetti TV. If you would like to find out more about this alien world, its history, and the wonderful life that inhabits it, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.